Welcome. This is the first session of uh, today, August the uh, 6th uh, session for the 2023 Almost Seven Star Party. And our first speaker is Paul Derby. Uh, Paul has been a key player in the Northern Virginia Astronomy Club. Uh, he joined the club in 2005. He has uh, been in a number of the officer roles. Uh, he's, uh, uh, if, if you've gone to the the uh, Sky Meadows Star Parties. He's been a volunteer coordinator there and uh, coordinates 130 different uh, NOVAC volunteers that are active with uh, Sky Meadows. Uh, he was a uh, past president of NOVAC. He's been our treasurer. He's uh, modernized our, our, our website, our financial systems. He's responsible for a lot of the great things that have happened there. Uh, in his work career, uh, he's started out with Control Data Corporation. Uh, he's had a variety. I, I could go on for you know half an hour about all the wonderful things he's done, but uh, he has been a pioneer in technology and especially as applied to astronomy. So I think rather than going on and on about that, I think they primarily want to hear Paul instead of Dan talking about Paul. So uh, Paul, I, I'm going to ask you to take it at this uh, point, please. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Dan. Now, let me uh, see if I can get the screen sharing going here with the first slide. Okay, well, um, I gave a talk on two years with the EV scope uh, a year ago for AHSP, and so this is kind of a catch up. Uh, I don't know how many of you have seen the video online or uh, were involved in it last year, but what I'll do is, uh, is rehash just a little bit of it. I think people know what EIA uh, uh, telescopes do, but I want to talk a bit more not only about the EV scope, but about some of the other scopes. And I want to talk a little bit about the, not only the science, but the sociology or the psychology or the human nature behind EAA somewhat, because you'll run into that either as a pro or con of the concept as the hobby goes through a transition from uh, traditional astronomy uh, observing to EAA observing. So, so what we'll do is look at this from an innovation uh, viewpoint, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about how knowledge is tied to human perception. And uh, knowledge tolerance is buffered by sentiment and tribalism. And you see a lot of that just in everyday things. You know, people are comfortable in, some people are very comfortable in what they do. And if change is introduced, they get pretty uptight. Other people just embrace change with a vengeance and they'll be the, the early adopters. And they'll go after it and pay extra money for it and all that. And others will hold on to being the expert in something that uh, they just love. A good example is when I was growing up in junior high school, I was interested in mathematics and science. My father was a scientist. And he said the best thing he, he felt, the best thing he could do is teach me how to use a slide rule. And so he started in on the C and D scale or whatever it was. That's been a long time ago. And, uh, and we were going to work our way to the K scale and these other scales that are on there. And he's busy explaining this and just excited as he can be. And I'm looking at this thing and I said, why would anyone care? Because uh, he's got a Marchand calculator in his lab and I can just push the buttons on it and it gets better answers than this slide rule does. And Texas Instrument had just come out with the SR10. And for a hundred bucks, it did what the six $3,000 Marchand calculator did. So I went tone deaf on learning how to use the slide rule and kind of picked up from there. And I think he always was upset with me that I never learned how to use the slide rule like he did. And so I wasn't a, going to be a true scientist or mathematician or a doctor of technology because I didn't do it the way he did. So that's my example of a transition where I was kind of a slug on it, but it didn't seem to hurt me. Uh, and um, so anyway, the, there's also monetary drivers that get into this stuff, uh, shareholder value versus consumer value. We won't get too much into that, but that's another background thing. You know, people are going to, companies are going to milk what they can sell until they can't sell it anymore. And then they'll introduce the new stuff unless they can position the marketing and the marketing is the key thing in there. And then the cost of technology is the other buffer in that. So we'll get into uh, uh, to those particular things. But let's look at a little bit of history. If we, if we look at innovation, if we're going to get to the EV scope through innovation, the, the, the thing that set the, scale, the, the base for everything is mathematics. There was arithmetic, and that turned into algebra, and then it went on to calculus, and then geometry, and statistics, and on and on and on. And, uh, you know, there's all the math that goes with quantum mechanics now, and that's kind of where we are on the bleeding edge. But anyway, uh, mathematics 
was the basis. And then on top of mathematics, which was a universal language that people could view things in, in a way with models that matched whatever uh, spoken language that they were using. There were some things that came along and we're not gonna go through the whole history of science. That would take a month or two, but let's just look at some highlights that I just picked out. You know, the rest of you might pick out others, but these are just some, just to get the idea. The first optical telescope lens was, uh, came around in 1608 by Hans Lippershey, and that was in the Netherlands. And it was just a, a, a simple, you know, a couple of lenses to see that, you know, you could have something very similar to a telescope. And then Galileo put a couple of them together in 1609, and that was just a year later in Italy, seeing the, the value there. And you all know what happened to Galileo. He, uh, he was, his book was, uh, uh, was banned. The Pope got upset with him. They kicked him out of the church, put him under house arrest, and uh, and uh, he just kind of ruined his career. But you know, he's the one that uh, you know that kind of set the uh, the pace for modern astronomy and the the technology that was there to do it. So that's an interesting story. And if you get a translation of uh, you know of his book, you know that's pretty interesting to read too. If you're into the history of this stuff, but it uh the main point of it is there's a lot of resistance to technology and that's kind of what you're going to bump up against in eaa so we're going to look at the good side of it and the resistance and how the two really go together it isn't that one there's a it isn't a judgmental thing it is an eaa over tradition or traditional astronomy or traditional astronomy over eaa both have a beautiful role some other notable innovations is the invention of longitude which was a real basis for for doing um coordinative uh mapping, if you will, and mapping of the earth was extended in a mapping of the skies. You know, we moved on from the angels pushing around epicenters and deference and that sort of stuff to, uh, you know, to getting to a way to just actually mapping and having coordinates and altas and all the things that we do to find things. And then Charles Babbage uh, came along and, and did on paper a difference engine, and there were some prototypes and pieces of it built and then not too long ago, they actually built a working model of it that's in the history or in the Science Museum in London. It was actually there about a year ago and took this picture. And it's a mechanical marble, but it allows computation. It's really just a really big, fancy adding machine, but it lets you compute things. And we're going to see in EAA how computing things is so important. And then there's more. Just some real highlights or vacuum tubes, you know, that got us past. Um, you know, Babbage's machine, the digital computer in Dickinson in 39 was an important step. The transistors, the invention of the transistors, you know, that Barden and Britton and William Shockley did through Bell Labs in 47. And then lasers came along around 1960. You could get one for about $10,000 in 1960. Now you can get a free one that from probably test driving a car that you can use for a cat toy. So that's come a long way. And a lot of us, including this talk that I'm giving right now, is coming to you over lasers, through laser technology, through uh, Verizon Fios. Um, integrated circuits was being able to cram thousands and thousands and now millions of transistors on a piece of silicon. And then Seymour Cray started the supercomputer business in 64. I joined the company that where Seymour Cray was and right up when I got out of college and uh, worked in their research and development labs out in Silicon Valley, and that's where I got my start. And uh, it was used a lot, especially in uh, in the space and science business. You know, NASA used control data computers that Seymour Cray designed, you know, to design the space shuttle and all the aerospace industry stuff, Lockheed Martin and and uh, North American Rockwell and Thiokol and all these companies were our customers. And so there's a big history of, the, especially the space technology there. Then personal computers came along and they evolved and during the 70s, and by the end of the 80s, they'd blown the, the mainframes out. There's still supercomputers kind of around, but the mainframe computers disappeared and kind of moved their way. And then Ethernet came along, and all these things are pieces to what I'm going to talk about in EAA. Ethernet, Robert Metcalf was doing Ethernet at MIT, and he proposed it for his master's uh, dissertation, and his committee laughed at him and said no one was interested in it, and he got pretty frustrated. So he went down Mass Avenue in Cambridge and talked to some people at Harvard and they embraced him and they, I'm sorry, he started out at Harvard and went down to Mass Avenue to MIT and they embraced it. 
and uh, and so he invented Ethernet and went on to start up 3Com, and that was one of the leading companies in the uh, in the communications business. And then along came the routers, um, you know, so that Ethernet could span around. And then Bitnet was what in in ARPA and ARPA and ARPANET and and uh, uh, the other dot nets before the internet came along were kind of fundamental to where we're getting and being able to communicate back and forth between devices and each other. Um, Bitnet was of particular interest to me. Uh, I was running a lab at Control Data at that time in 83, and Bitnet was strictly uh, government and research institutes and universities up until 83. And then in 83, I filled out three tons of paperwork and filed it with a sponsor in Bitnet. And uh, Control Data was the second literally dot com or commercial business on Bitnet along with IBM. And then we were one of one of the first ones on the internet when uh, the internet came along when Tim Berners-Lee kicked that off with the World Wide Web, you know, getting that tied into a web browser so that you could use it. And then if you just fast forward, now we've got the internet of things, which is exactly where EAA technology fits. If there's anything, any place you can describe EAA telescopes, they're just internet of things devices. And so along came this internet thing, uh, the Unistar EB scope innovation case study that I'm going to talk about. Uh, the Unistellar EV scope was uh, the probably the first uh, true EAA, which is electronic assisted astronomy, that um, that had a commercial presence. There's other video type augmented things like Malincoms and similar type devices before, but I wouldn't call those EAA in the way that we're going to talk about it today. So this started off with a Kickstarter project. In 2015, there was a small team in Marseille, France, and they built an EV scope prototype and kind of refined it. They put the uh, thing out on Kickstarter. They almost immediately got over 2,000 backers that pledged $2.2 million, which blew their minds. It was the, it was the number one uh, Kickstarter project ever at that time. And I was backer number 631 of those 2144. And, and I pledged twelve hundred ninety nine dollars on in two thousand and seventeen to support the project. And it was supposed to come out uh, in December of two thousand and eighteen. Well, it came out in June of two thousand and twenty, but it was worth the wait. And there was a number of years in there where I thought I just funded some really cool people that had a good idea, but maybe someone later was really pull it off. They weren't, but they finally did pull it off. Um, I was excited about it and talked about it on cloudy nights and Novak, and uh, there were ex lots of doubts expressed about the project. They considered it hype claims, suspected funding fraud. People were trolling all over the place, talking about how uh, how uh, you know this thing could never happen, especially with what they described as the technology, which was basically basically a four and a half uh, inch Newtonian and. Uh, you know, in a 450 millimeter lens and uh, in a kind of a, a bottom of the barrel uh, Sony camera. That's what they were putting together and claiming all sorts of things that people didn't believe. So 50 unistellar status emails later, the project closed in August of 2021. And uh, they delivered 5,600 telescopes despite COVID causing supply chain manufacturing impact and my scope arrived in June of 2020 with the number that I the number that I held in the delivery. Uh, they were putting out some prototype images early so that, to whet everyone's appetite to join in this project. And one of the, the first things that they showed was an image of the Ring Nebula made with what their prototype and there it is. Uh, and that's what they were showing. This whetted a lot of appetite for people to throw 1999 at it and uh, get on the bandwagon. And then uh, there were some people were doubting it and they said, well, well, maybe they stored an image of the bubble nebulae and when the thing is aimed at where it's supposed to be, they're just throwing the image up there. And so they were showing one of these things off in San Francisco up by the Legion of Honor up on the hill there toward the, toward the Pacific Ocean banks, you know, on the coast. And they were looking at uh, M31, the Hercules cluster. And they got photobombed by an airplane that was landing at SFO. So there's the, uh, <laughs> the lights that were flashing during the during the exposure times, the 
the series of exposures during one of the exposures, um, there are four second exposures. So in four seconds, the airplane traversed the area where M31 was, and that kind of put down the the uh, the doubters on the fact that whether or not it was actually collecting real data or just superimposing data. Um, I took my, here's the first light on my EV scope. I live in Falls Church and uh, lots of people like to, like to talk about skies and bortle this and bortle that. Um, here, I and all the people that live in this area don't use the bortle scale. We use the number of visible star scale. And usually our visible stars are zero. And on a good night, we have four and one of them is Jupiter. And so I was out on a, on a three or four star night, one of them being Jupiter. And um, I have trees all around my house. So I walked down four houses to a big church parking lot and set up the, the new EV scope that I had just gotten and uh, turned the thing on and went through the process that I'll describe in a minute or two. And, uh, and grabbed M51, the Whirlpool Galaxy, on the left-hand side, and that just blew me away. And uh, and I looked at some other things, and then I brought it home and downloaded the Whirlpool Galaxy image, and then I threw it on my Mac and just used the Mac uh, video photo editor that's on there, and uh, and uh, adjusted the contrast and used Topaz denoise to get rid of the background noise and to get rid of the uh, to get the contrast up and ended up with this on the right hand side so this was my first attempt and this happened in one evening in less than an hour from start to finish and my experience with pix insight started in six months from start to finish to do about the same thing so there's a that's why this got my attention and my uh, experience with photoshop one that i started using when it came out 1983 was another three-month learning curve instead of a 10-minute learning curve. So here's what they put in it, for those of you that may not be interested. There, here's the EV scope sitting up in my front yard. And it's a Newtonian telescope, 112 millimeter aperture, which I mentioned before, 450 millimeter focal length, it's F4. So it's not particularly a long focal length, but the reason these guys in Marcier picked the thing out is because it lends itself to the, to the, um, to the Mer Mercier objects. You know, those, uh, what is it, 110 of them or whatever it is, they are the faint fuzzies out there that work well at this particular focal length. And F4, you know, kept the thing in the ballpark for cost. It's fast enough, but it's not F2 and it, and it doesn't have a focal reducer on it, you know, to amplify the photons that are coming in, that sort of thing. It ends up with about 50x optical magnification you know, when you're looking at what it's putting on the surface of the Sony sensor, it's an Altaz mount, so it's not gonna be great mechanically. You know, it's gonna be worse than a Lasmondi G11, which is what I had at that earlier uh, with a L Mead LX200. So it's uh, quite a bit different than a Mead LX2, a 10 inch Mead LX200 and a, uh, and a Lasmondi German equatorial mount. And the sensor on it is the Sony Exmor IX, you know, IMX224, which is kind of a, a lower end sensor. And it included a tripod and the tripod is very well made. It's uh, lightweight, it has, uh, it reminds me of a Gitzo. It isn't near the quality of a Gitzo. It's probably more of a $200 tripod than an $800 tripod, but it's, it's pretty nice. And so, that's what people were looking at and saying, there's no way that this thing could be 10 times better than anything else of this focal length. And what they were missing was what they did in systems integration. And that's what we'll talk about next. So just going through what happened in less than 10 minutes from setup to observing is you take the tripod out of the backpack and, and set it up. There I am with the thing on my back and the tripod straps on the side and the telescopes inside. And, uh, and there's a, a couple of other things like a big bubble level that I put in in there and it weighs 20 pounds and it's real easy to carry around. Uh, and then you level the tripod. So I picked this 70 millimeter bubble level up on Amazon because the little bubble level that is on it is is too hard for me to look at and not. And I didn't feel it was precise enough for my 75 year old eyes. For those of you in your 20s, it would be just fine, I'm sure. Then I put the, the scope in a tripod cup. If you take the bubble level off there, just a cup, and you just put the uh, scope in there, and then you press the on button, 
okay? And there's no wires, no wires whatsoever. You don't hook up a battery pack. You don't hook up any data wires. You don't hook up any wiring whatsoever. You just push the button and it turns uh, dark red. And then you connect an iPhone up. You turn on your iPhone and you load up the uh, EV, the Unistellar app and uh, you uh, uh, hook the Wi-Fi access point that the, that the telescope broadcasts over to the iPhone. You could do the same thing with an Android. And then you use the app to look at, uh, well, first you uh, focus it. And so there's a batten off mask that comes right in the lens cap. So you just, it just kind of uh, side slots into the lens cap. So you just unslot the thing, put it on the end of the telescope and you get an X with a vertical line. And then you rotate the focusing knob on the back of the unicellular telescope, the EV scope one, or the later ones that they've come out with. And you just line up the vertical line and then you're focused. And if you just take your fingers and and uh, and spread them apart to blow the image up, you can focus it even finer than this. This is a full screen image of it, but I, when I do it, I just part my fingers on it and and uh, use my fingers to magnify the image on my iPhone, and then line it up that way. Or if I'm using an iPad, I've got a bigger screen and I can very precisely line up that vertical mark. That's the only thing you touch. That's the only adjustment on the EV scope. Uh, that's it. And then in the app, you pick an object from uh, a catalog that's available and uh, find out whatever you want. It only shows you what's above the horizon. And, uh, and then you uh, click what you want and you watch the scope slew to it. And, and it will slew until it centers the object and then and it says go to validated up there. Uh, you do that right ahead. And when it gets right dead center on that object, you're good to go. So there's kind of the steps. I, I, I missed uh, pushing the button to, uh, to, uh, to do the plate solving on the stars and then you slew to the object and then you're just good to go on this thing. So that's basically it. And I spent longer talking about it than it takes to do. So that's what we're talking about there. And so there's um, M13. And then you press enhance mode down here and where the er yellow arrow is pointing. And it starts taking four minutes of exposures. Uh, and then over time, here's what it looks like at four minutes. Back before it's what it looks like. And this is basically what you would see through a normal telescope. This isn't using any optical enhancement or any uh, computer enhancement. And so here's what enhanced vision looks like at the start. And even with the four, uh, this is after four minutes of four second exposures. And so this just appears before your eye like magic. And what it's doing, when you're looking at a regular telescope with your eyes, your rods and your cones are looking through an optical device and all they, all they can see is what your eye is capable of seeing. The Sony uh, uh, camera is sitting there and it's taking in photons and the photons are building up. And if you just think of a, of a Digital camera is a big bundle of drinking straws, and the number of megapixels you have in the camera is the number of drinking straws you have. And when the photons fall into the drinking straws, they 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 count up. You know, it's a charge. Actually, it's an electrical charge, and then that becomes a number, and that number uh, determines the picture that you have when you read it out into memory. And so, by letting it count up photons and for four seconds at a time, and then another four seconds at a time, and another four seconds at a time, with all these sub exposures, and then integrating those, you watch the vision uh, just get better and better. Here we are now up to 11 minutes. So here was four minutes, here's 11 minutes. And then we hop over and look at the great Nebula and Orion, and you never see this visually, but in 44 minutes, you can see this particular thing where you start seeing nebulosity with M42. And way back at the beginning, you start seeing the nebula way better than you would see with a regular normal telescope, optical telescope only, without the digital enhancement present, you know, to get to something like this. So that's the difference in the two. And then here's another example. This is 14 minutes with uh, M51, the Whirlpool Galaxy, and its neighbor there over to the side. And you never see that with an optical telescope of, of this length or of 
pretty much any length. It's just the number of photons that you can gather in integrate. And so it's the integration of these photons that is the, is the secret sauce in this particular Internet of Things device. And without going through all the Messier objects, I just went through a few of them. There's a guy named Ray Young who's been active in this in the early days, and he set out to, to capture as many of them as he could, and he made a mosaic of all the ones that he captured with his EV scope. And there you can see lots and lots of them in this uh, matrix. And then in the lower right-hand corner is the moon. And the moon isn't great because it, the, uh, uh, the brightness of the moon just kind of blows this thing out of the water. They've made some software changes that have toned that down a bit and makes the moon better now, but it still isn't ideal. And so it's really not designed for planetary reflective objects with detail. It's really designed for capturing photons, whether they're emission photons that are coming from nebulae or they're, it's emitted light that's coming from stars, things of that nature. Okay, now why would you want one of these? I got it for outreach. I wanted something that I could set up really quickly and I can set this up in 10 minutes. And I've been real active out at Sky Meadows. Uh, a couple of months ago, this is uh, two months ago in June, here's the crowd gathering for a night at Sky Meadows. If you haven't been out there, it's, I encourage you to come. It, it's every month of the year uh, on a Saturday night. Uh, you can look at the Sky Meadows website or the Novak website and see what the dates are. I think the next one is Saturday after next. And uh, in a tart, it starts right around sunset, so it varies time of year. It'll be uh, 7.30 during August. It was seven o'clock during June and July, 7.30 in August. And it'll start as early as 4.30 when we get to December, you know, when we have the shorter days. And if the weather's decent, we'll have uh, 20 or 30 volunteers show up with their telescopes, and we'll have four or 500 people show up to look. And it's just a phenomenal crowd. Woody Davis and his wife, uh, Dory, do a program ahead, about 30 minutes, about what's current in space. And then, uh, uh, and then the crowd shows up, and they stay for three hours, and the rangers have to chase them out of the park at the night. They get so interested in what we're doing. So it's an incredible outreach event. And the EV scope is fantastic for that. And I get a crowd every night and get hoarse and people, the people that are really interested in it will hang around for an hour just watching it in amazement. So there's a thrill in getting people that interested in astronomy that really turns me on. I've got other telescopes that I take out by myself to do deep space imaging and, you know, and the stuff that I like to do. I've got a, a William Optics FLT 110 and a, you know, and a high-end uh, ZWO camera and, you know, and filter wheels and filters and, you know, all the stuff that, those of you who are doing uh, black and white, stacking all the stuff in pics and sight know about, that's what I do, you know, for the technical challenge side of it. For the human interaction and the outreach, I use the EV scope. And I've used the EV scope in the last three years more than I've used my other six telescopes combined over 20 years. So it paid for itself many times over if I lost, look at the cost per use. For outreach, I just level a tripod, stake down the iPad stand, uh, the uh, iPad stand legs. I, I set up an iPad for the EV scope to transmit to. I learned the first night out there that people kick these things over if they're in, if you're in the dark, and I caught it just before it hit the ground. So now I take these uh, these tent stake things that are called orange screws and screw them in the ground. And with that, it comes in the container. The, the silver container in the middle is the holder for the orange screw. I take the orange screw out, use it as the lever, screw it in the ground, and then use a, a piece of, uh, of bungee cord to tie the thing down and then stick a, a red light, keychain red light on there that I turn on so that people can see it at night. And uh, have an observing chair out there, a table to put the backpack on so that it won't sit in the dew at night. And it kind of holds the gear. I bring a iPad battery pack for the iPad or, uh, or a, uh, jack of, a Jackery battery pack, one of the two. Either one works just fine. I've never had to put the uh, EV scope on a battery pack. The battery lasts uh, at least four or five hours. I've run it as long as five hours and had charge left. I've never stayed past 2 a.m. with it. And then I've got a kneeling pad that I bought at a tile installation place, and that helps a lot when you get on your knees to put in these orange screws. And when you 
if you drop something, you need to look around in the tall turf to find things. And sometimes I'll bring a laser pointer, kind of a maybe, but generally I'll just tell people to look at where the telescope was pointed or to go over and in, in sight above it. And I'll say, that's where we're looking at this point in the sky and kind of use your thumb to see what we're looking at. So people gravitate to the iPad screens like crazy. They can see the stars fly by when it's going from ob one object to another. And it uses a uh, successive uh, approximation to do to lock in, to get over the mechanical shortcomings of the alt Alice motors. The motors aren't that precise. So it takes a, it knows approximately the lat long that it's aimed at. It knows the lat long of where it needs to, or the celestial coordinates either way, uh, the celestial coordinates to where it needs to aim at approximately where the object is that it's looking for. It looks at the stars briefly and from the geometry of that, it figures the deviation for where it needs to go and then does another iteration to get to the celestial coordinates for that. And it just keeps iterating toward the celestial coordinates, starting out with the lat long and then going to the celestial coordinates. So that's why I mentioned the, the uh, discovery of uh, longitude to go with, uh, or latitude to enable this to work is one of the historical things. And uh, there's always lots of questions and the EV scope has lots of answers over there. I can just flip up and it'll tell them everything they want to know about the object that we're looking at. And the EV scope supports 10 people that can hook on to the uh, Wi-Fi access point so they can look and capture the pictures themselves. And usually four or five each night of the dozens that stream by or the hundreds that stream by will are so interested in it, they'll load the, uh, the app down and they'll participate in as an interest of observer you know, with me as the operator. Both uh, Veri uh, Verizon and T-Mobile and AT&T have service out at Sky Meadows, pretty good service. T-Mobile has G5 out there. Okay. Uh, you can text or email the images while the scope is building up the images. That has huge crowd appeal. There's the 10 mobile observers that can be on with you. Okay. And then what makes the EV scope different? Well, down below are the technologies that go into the EV scope. And so if you uh, if you remember Kuvi, the lazy geek, he has a YouTube channel and he bought a 50 millimeter scope and, uh, and a camera, a, a low-end camera, a low-end ZWO camera and a tripod and uh, some uh, public domain software and showed that for under $1,000, you could build something to compete with the EV scope. And so I bought what he said would do that and put it together and there's no competition because it's missing a whole bunch of this technology that's under the picture right here. It is a fun thing to do. And if you're in the systems integration and stringing a bunch of wires and a steep learning curve, for under a thousand dollars, you can get something that sort of works. But if you go ahead and spend the, the 2K for the EV scope, you get, uh, you get something with a GPS in it. You've got a tripod, you've got, you leverage, all of this technology that's here and it's the smarts that leverage this technology and have integrated it together that these guys in Marseille France did that make this thing work. So that's the secret sauce that makes it work. It's a system engineering focused on user experience solution. In other words, a systems integration solution. Oh, and then the quote from Isaac Newton, I've seen, if I have seen further, it's by standing on the shoulders of giants. That's exactly what they did was stand on the folders of the giants that did all this technology to bring the EV scope. And then the competitors to the EV scope are doing the same thing. So it's, it's the innovation that makes it different. And if you want to see the technical insight and the Unistellar's integration, Jan Kaiser did reverse engineering notes and he published those on GitHub. So you can go out on GitHub on the internet and search for Unistellar EV scope research. And there you'll see what the hardware is inside of it. If you, I haven't taken mine apart yet. Maybe someday I will. And I like taking things apart and seeing how they work, but I haven't done it yet on this one. But there's a Raspberry Pi 3A plus in there. It has a custom board on top where, you know, that's the intellectual property that Unistellar has put in there. And then the Sony camera, and then they've got a 16 gig SanDisk micro SD card and the later in the EV scope two and the, and the uh, Equinox to the later Unistellar scopes, they've got bigger, micro SD cards in there. I haven't exceeded the memory on mine yet though, on the original. Uh, so 
if we look at why the pushback and why the acceptance, what we're dealing with on the human side is pluralism versus monism, if you want to get into the academic side of this. And a contemporary extremism is what hinders progress. And it's absolutism that stifles dialogue on it. So if you have people that are experts that absolutely don't like something, that's the extremism, and they just use their power to shut, shut things down, uh, that's what blows innovation away. The biggest compliment I've been paid is Paul likes to throw things at the wall and see what sticks. And to me, that's what innovators do. You, you, you've got a body of knowledge and then you throw things at the wall to see what sticks and out of it, you learn from your mistakes and you bring out, bring forth things like this. And that's what these guys have done. And that's what the company I worked for for many years that built the supercomputers did and other companies. And William James believes, uh, the philosopher, believes that uh, those that love singularities are the ones that are pushing things down. And we can see this in everyday life. You know, people that have one method, one political system, one value system, they're extremists and they get to violent mentalities on it. And that's the thing that stifles innovation and just the opposite generates innovation. So if you're interested in following in on that, I'll show you something a little bit later where you can read more on it. Then there's some business dynamics that are in there, you know, where meltdowns will cause things to, to blow away. This, this company almost went bankrupt and other companies have almost gone bankrupt. Southwest Airlines did a meltdown because they had optimized their operations for a perfect environment. And then COVID and piler outages and weather and all sorts of stuff hiccuped and they stranded tons of people over Christmas last year and things like that. The US healthcare system is, is set up now to maximize revenue and profits and we're paying for it in life expectancy. And there's uh, charge masters that all the health care providers have that extract maximum revenue and all that. Then there's pharmacy benefit management companies that do that. These things are just examples and it's no different in astronomy companies. I'm just using them as real life examples. And society needs to get past this monetization and singularity and get innovation going for the greater good. So when things like EAA comes along and whatever comes after it and whatever enhances it, I encourage those of you to, if you only are in, if you, if you don't believe in it and you think it's lies, take a deep breath and maybe see what it might happen with it and see both sides of the fence on it. And that's what's going to get our hobby going further. The book that kind of gets into this is one by Wayne Viney. Uh, and he's written this book. It's in the slide there. If you wanted, it, it's an academic book, but it gets way into this if you're into the, if you happen to be in the management of innovation or if you want to be an advocate to get into innovation. Okay, let's get back to the unistellar uh, cost of ownership. A lot of people balk about the cost of ownership and you'll see posted on the internet, oh, why would I spend $5,000 for one of these telescopes? That was just posted last week and I replied to it saying, well, yeah, one of them is $5,000, but the other one's $2,500 and they run sales all the time. So you're really talking about $2,000. And the only difference between the two is this Nikon eyepiece that they buy for about $2,000 and stick in there and it gives you a prettier view of the screen on the camera inside that you're looking at. So if you can live without having a Nikon eyepiece looking at the prettier screen and get the, the Equinox instead of the EV scope, you can get into this for $2,500 full retail. And I just looked yesterday evening and there's a $200 discount going right now. So you can get in it for $2,200. And so that makes the gap between that and rolling your own if you do the Queeve Lazy Geek thing that doesn't even approach what this does, you know, th there's the two there. Uh, there's alternatives too. There's uh, the Dwarf Lab. Dwarf Labs has one, they have the Dwarf 2. Uh, Unistellar has the Equinox 2 and the EV Scope 2 now. Uh, Vionis has three things that are out now, the Hyperia for $45,000. So if you think the EV Scope's expensive, Go look at a Vionis Hyperia. There's the ultimate EAA. I don't think there's one of those in, in uh, any member in Novak yet. But for the club that has too many uh, Rolls Royces and, and uh, you know, and uh, million dollar cars and million dollar this, that, and the other toys, Hyperia is there for the Vionis crowd. And they've got Stellene and Vespera also. 
ZWO has something called a C Stars S50 that is supposed to come out later this month. That is about a $500 one, which will be very interesting. ZWO is a very established company as opposed to these other companies that are startups. And then Vionis is getting in the competition with it too. They just announced this morning, this Hestia, I believe it was just announced this morning. It's the first I've seen. I got an email from Kickstarter on it and bought one. You know, I, it's, uh, I think it was $200. And the way it works, it's that little, what they're purporting to do is this thing that is about the size of a paperback book. And you lay your iPhone or your Android inside of it in the, and it moves around the, the, uh, the way that it lines up with the lens on the smartphone and then broadcasts to, a, to your Android device or your iPhone uh, images. And so it's a real easy thing. You just put it on your tripod or you can get it with the tripods. That's another one to watch. So here are some other things in the EAA space. So with that, let's uh, see if I can get this thing back and stop presenting and open this up for discussion. Great talk, Paul. Thank you. Okay. Now, any questions or anyone just unmute and uh, shoot at it. Let's see. It looks like there's a, maybe there's a chat with everyone or there's some questions over here in it. George has a question. Oh, okay, George. Well, yeah, I, I know. That's a very nice talk. It describes uh, what you can do with this very well. I, I do the same thing you do at Sky Meadows, and I've always had a crowd that lasts for the whole time. And I'm forced when I'm done with the talk i've never really needed any battery for anything because what i do is i charge my tablet and phone up to maximum before i come so i i've not ever run out <laughs> so aside from that um, it's really good there's a hood you can put on top of the telescope too uh you didn't mention the hood which maybe cuts down on dew and especially if you're going to do something from your backyard it cuts down on what the neighborhood lights can do to screw yeah. you up yeah good point so, yeah but that's uh it's, it's amazing how, how it does attract people I and mean, you, you can just it just runs all the time and if it's all cloudy and you can't see anything at all and you can't you can't make an image you always have a gallery like he showed ray young's gallery you can just show people stuff in the gallery there were two people that came out to crockett where i was using it uh recently and they had to leave at nine o'clock because the, there was a, little, a young girl within the mother insisted that the girl be home by around nine o'clock. So, of course, they couldn't see anything because it just gets dark there now. So I just grabbed my phone and I started showing them images of my gallery. And uh, they they walked away and they learned something. They saw something in the sky, even though they left before it got dark enough to see anything with any telescope. Yeah, yeah, good point. Yeah, but Sky Meadows, we do the program monthly, rain or shine. And if it rains, we move into the barn and we do exactly what George described. We just show the images that, that, that we captured for the crowd the month before, and that works fine. And, and then they get to see the equipment and the images without seeing it in, in real time, but it's still very effective and it allows us to do outreach even in bad weather. Uh, Chris, you've got a question or a comment? Hey, Paul, thanks a lot. That's a, a great presentation. I, I know I listened in last, last time you did it. Uh, so I appreciate the presentation and the update. I, I do have a question. Um, as far as when you're when you're taking images, and I, I know you said uh, there's an SD card that's uh, included. Um, is that where all the images are stored, or you, can you get them easily transferred to your to your iPhone if you're using that to like photos uh, to an album? Um, is that is that are you able to do that? And my second question is. Uh, I know you said if if you're at Sky Meadows and you're the operator showing the the participants, the the public there, if if they're logged into the app viewing what you're doing, can they download images as well? Uh, yeah. On the first thing, uh, the images are put on the SD card, and the images also every time you shift images, it stores the uh, the image in your photo library on your smartphone, and so the images, but the 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 images that are stored on your smartphone are uh, PNGs, I believe. Okay. Yeah, they're PNG. Well, they're actually uh, if you're on a if you're on an iOS device, it's uh, it's Apple's uh, H. Uh, what is it? H E. I forget that thing. It's H E I C. H E I C. Yeah, 
it's ATIC. And then if you're on an Android, it's, I think, a PNG. I'm not sure. I don't have an Android. It may, it's either that or a JPEG. Okay. If you want the FITS files, you can get those. And the way you, you get that is to uh, just send a note to Unistellar support. And within 24 hours, they send you a link. The Unistellar app is hosted on Amazon Web Services. And uh, if you, when you get the thing home, you upload your images. And what they're doing there is you're uploading them to uni, to, with the serial number of your telescope to Amazon Web Services. And then they keep them there for uh, 90 days, I think, 60 or 90 days. I can't remember which. And then if you want the, the raw FITS files, then you send tech support an email saying, I want the FITS files for serial number such and such and, uh, and give them your name and they can verify it. And then they send you a link and you download the FITS files and then you can do PixInsight with it if you want to or whatever you okay. want to do with it. Very nice. So those are the two routes on that. And uh, if someone comes in in observer mode, they can also uh, grab the images. They just touch a button on the app and it puts it in their photo library. And then at the same time, they can text it to their friends. And I do the same thing. Uh, if people don't want to download the app, I'll, uh, I'll just say, well, if you don't mind sharing your phone number, I'll just, if you want a souvenir from tonight, I'll just text the image to you and I just send it to them. And people just start giggling. It's just, uh, <laughs> it's just amazing the reaction you get when they can leave with a, with the picture that they see and they can say, oh, I went out to Sky Meadows and, and here's a picture of what I saw. And then they okay. go around and see the other telescopes and compare what they see there also. Okay. You know, no, that's very cool. If you yeah. don't mind, one more question. Um, uh, so I noticed uh, when you mentioned uh, the focusing routine, you have to use the batten off mask. I'm um, assuming that's a manual process. Do you expect uh, Unistellar to implement or innovate a, an auto focusing routine uh, going forward? I doubt it because, uh, uh, you know, throwing that in there is going to add weight to it and Okay. And uh, and you when you're precise, I'm I'm not sure the servo motors are going to get near as precise as your eye is going to get with a batten off mask. So I'm I hope I'm wrong. I hope they can figure it out and do it. And there's some breakthrough, but I would be surprised if they do that. It's real easy to do. And then there's a whole bunch of people on the internet that have this phobia about collimation. Mm -hmm. And uh, I I decided after two years that maybe I needed to collimate mine because I hadn't collimated it since I took it out of the box. And so I screwed around with it and spent $125 for an artificial star and set the thing up. Fortunately, my house was where I could get a 60 foot shot at the thing indoors at night and, and messed around collimating it. And I couldn't do any better than it came collimated. And so, uh, and then I'm, then I made a big acetate layover to lay on an iPad so that I could get the concentric rings just perfect. And you're going to get some, some distortion on the corners on this thing. You know, it's not a, it's not a C11 edge or, you know, it doesn't have a, a, a field flattener in it. You know, those sorts of things. It's a, it's a, you know, it's a 450 millimeter, four and a half inch Newton. That's what it is. And so that's what you're going to get. Uh, but if you just take the center of it and if you just concentrate on the objects in the middle, you're good to go. If you're trying to do some big wide field thing where you're doing the, the full uh, range of that image sensor, then you're not probably not going to, you will find fault in it if you're a perfectionist. Okay. Thanks, and then thanks you need so to go call. to something else, if that makes it, sense. It's not hard to call them it anyway. If you have to call them it, it's not, uh, they say it's, well, it's a little harder than they say, but it's not really hard. Yeah, it's easy. It's a Torx screwdriver. Right. It's a Torx 20, I think. And they send you one in the box it, with it. They give you a toolkit. Yeah. yeah, I did it when it was, in fact, it was cloudy. There were clouds going over the star I was using to do it. I still managed to call them it was okay. Yeah. I have, Chris, did that, did that answer your question? It did. I, I really appreciate it, Paul. Yeah. Okay. I was at the, uh, the spring uh, Stanton River Star Party and uh, uh, had a great audience for it. And then there was one guy who came by who started uh, – kind of heckling from the side and i was actually on the silver needle galaxy and people were saying oh wait a minute you want you got to come over here and see this this looks awesome he refused to look in it and he said that that's mm -hmm. going not see anything deeper than 13th magnitude i said come over here and i'll show you some 15th 16th magnitude galaxies he refused to walk 
five feet over and look at the screen. It was like, you know, it, he was just, he had his mind made up and he was not going to see anything that might be different than that. Was, yeah. <laughs> there's, a, there's a modern day inquisition in action. Yeah. <laughs> I got a good, a good image in, in Potomac where it's really cloudy of a coma cluster. And you can look at that and just count galaxies all over the field of view. So you look, it looks like you have a, you know, a web. It looks like you have a deep sky, at, you know, hours. So that's 320 million light years out. Okay. Something like that. Yeah, great. Well, thank you, everyone. I, I it's, a, it's a pleasure and an honor to, to, to do this. And for those of you that join later on YouTube, uh, I, uh, I, if you have anything, you know, on there, you can reach out to us, uh, you know, through Novak and be glad to answer any questions or come out to Sky Meadows and see these things in action. That's one way to, to uh, there's not a showroom, but that can act as your showroom. Just come out there. So, Chris, uh, here we go. It's uh, turn it back to you.